Hello everybody, Game Killer Daddy here, and welcome to my new mini series of The Wheel of Time. What I'll be doing is taking some of my favorite parts, and hopefully some of you guys' favorite parts too, uh, special events or parts from the book that really stuck out in my mind, or that I just loved, uh, that I can't wait to get to when I start reading them, and making little clips and putting it out there for you guys of those specific parts throughout the whole Wheel of Time series. Um, the book was written by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. Um, I'll be taking clips from the audio books um, read by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. They do an excellent job. If you've never listened to the audio books and you're a Wheel of Time fan, you should definitely give it a go. Give it a listen. They have voice, different voices for everybody. You know which character is talking. You know what's going on. Who's saying what? You're you're not lost. Oh, who's that? Or you know who said that? You you know each character. They do an excellent job. Um, I have nothing to do whatsoever with the wheel of time or the embodiment of the will of time or any entity having anything to do with the will of time. I'm doing this because well, for two reasons, one that I really love the will of time series and I need to hopefully get more subscribers since YouTube changed their policy. Um, but I hope all of y'all like this as well. Um, if there's anybody out there that likes to draw, uh, Wheel of Time stuff. I'll leave an email down in the description that you can send it to. Just put in the subject, you know, what it's about or which character it is, Land, Nynaeve, Rand, Catswing, um, anything. That way, if I'm doing a special clip on, you know, a certain character, I can go and quickly find any artwork you guys send for that character or event. And if there's a special part from any of the books that you guys would like me to get to first or like me to do, please leave a comment down below. Let me know. I'll be happy to do it. I may even say, hey, this is for so-and-so. So please hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out. Uh, if you like the videos or audio video clips, give it a thumbs up and hit that little bell so you'll be alerted the next time I put out one of these or anything else put out by the Game Killers. And thank you for all your support. There was a tap at the door, and Lan stuck his head into the room. Say your goodbyes quickly, Sheepherder, and come. There may be trouble. Trouble? Rand said, and the warder growled at him impatiently. Just hurry. Hastily, Rand snatched up his cloak. He started to undo the sword belt, but Tam spoke up. Keep it. You will probably have more need of it than I, though the light willing, neither of us will. Take care, lad. You hear? Ignoring Lan's continued growls, Rand bent to grab Tam in a hug. I will come back. I promise you that. Of course you will, Tam laughed. He returned the hug weakly, and ended by patting Rand on the back. I know that. And I'll have twice as many sheep for you to tend when you return. Now go, before that fellow does himself an injury. Rand tried to hang back, tried to find the words for the question he did not want to ask, but Lan entered the room to catch him by the arm and pull him into the hall. The warder had donned a dull gray-green tunic of overlapping metal scales. His voice rasped with irritation. We have to hurry. Don't you understand the word trouble? Outside the room, Matt waited, cloaked and coated, and carrying his bow. A quiver hung at his waist. He was rocking anxiously on his heels, and he kept glancing off toward the stairs with what seemed to be equal parts impatience and fear. This isn't much like the stories, Rand, is it? He said hoarsely. What kind of trouble? Rand demanded, but the warder ran ahead of him instead of answering, taking the steps down two at a time. Matt dashed after him with quick gestures for Rand to follow. Shrugging into his cloak, he caught up to them downstairs. Only a feeble light filled the common room. Half the candles had burned out, and most of the rest were guttering. It was empty except for the three of them. Matt stood next to one of the front windows, peeping out as if trying not to be seen. 
Lan held the door open a crack and peered into the inn yard. Wondering what they could be watching, Rand went to join him. The warder muttered at him to take a care, but he did open the door a trifle wider to make room for Rand to look, too. At first he was not sure exactly what he was seeing. A crowd of village men, some three dozen or so, clustered near the burned-out husk of the peddler's wagon, night pushed back by the torches some of them carried. Moraine faced them, her back to the inn, leaning with seeming casualness on her walking staff. Harry Coplin stood in the front of the group with his brother Darl and Billy Conger. Sen Bowie was there as well, looking uncomfortable. Rand was startled to see Harry shake his fist at Moraine. Leave Emmons Field, the sour-faced farmer shouted. A few voices in the crowd echoed him, but hesitantly, and no one pushed forward. They might be willing to confront an Aes Sedai from within a crowd, but none of them wanted to be singled out. Not by an Aes Sedai, who had every reason to take offense. You brought those monsters, Darl roared. He waved a torch over his head, and there were shouts of, You brought them, and it's your fault, led by his cousin Billy. Hari elbowed Sen Bui, and the old Thatcher pursed his lips and gave him a sidelong glare. Those things, those trollocs, didn't appear until after you came, Sen muttered, barely loud enough to be heard. He swung his head from side to side dourly as if wishing he were somewhere else and looking for a way to get there. You're an I, said I. We want none of your sort in the two rivers. I, said I, bring trouble on their backs. If you stay, you will only bring more. His speech brought no response from the gathered villagers, and Hari scowled in frustration. Abruptly, he snatched Darl's torch and shook it in her direction. Get out, he shouted. I will burn you out. Dead silence fell, except for the shuffling of a few feet as men drew back. Two rivers folk could fight back if they were attacked, but violence was far from common, and threatening people was foreign to them, beyond the occasional shaking of a fist. Sen Bui, Billy Conger, and the Coplins were left out front alone. Billy looked as if he wanted to back away, too. Hari gave an uneasy start at the lack of support, but he recovered quickly. Get out! he shouted again, echoed by Darl, and more weakly by Billy. Hari glared at the others. Most of the crowd failed to meet his eye. Suddenly, Bran Alvir and Hara Luhan moved out of the shadows, stopping apart from both the Aes Sedai and the crowd. In one hand, the mayor casually carried the big wooden maul he used to drive spigots into casks. Did someone suggest burning my inn? He asked softly. The two Coplins took a step back and Sen Bui edged away from them. Billy Conger dived into the crowd. Not that, Darl said quickly. We never said that, Bran. Uh, mayor? Bran nodded. Then perhaps I heard you threatening to harm guests in my inn? She's an Aes Sedai, Hari began angrily, but his words cut off as Haro Luhan moved. The blacksmith simply stretched, thrusting thick arms over his head, tightening massive fists until his knuckles cracked, but Hari looked at the burly man as if one of those fists had been shaken under his nose. Haro folded his arms across his chest. Your pardon, Hari. I did not mean to cut you off. You were saying... But Hari... Shoulders hunched as though he were trying to draw into himself and disappear, seemed to have nothing more to say. I'm surprised at you people, Bran rumbled. Petal Carr, your boy's leg was broken last night, but I saw him walking on it today, because of her. Edward Candon, you were lying on your belly with a gash down your back like a fish for cleaning, till she laid hands on you. Now it looks as if it happened a month ago. And unless I misdoubt, there'll be barely a scar. And you, Sen, the Thatcher started to fade back into the crowd, but stopped, held uncomfortably by Bran's gaze. I'd be shocked to see any man on the village council here, Sen, but you most of all. Your arm would still be hanging useless at your side, a mass of burns and bruises, if not for her. If you have no gratitude, have you no shame? Sen half lifted his right hand, then looked away from it angrily. I cannot deny what she did, he muttered, and he did sound ashamed. She helped me and others, he went on in a pleading tone. But she's an Aes Sedai, Bran. If those Trollocs didn't come because of her, 
Why did they come? We want no part of Aes Sedai in the two rivers. Let them keep their troubles away from us. A few men, safely back in the crowd, shouted then. We want no Aes Sedai troubles. Send her away. Drive her out. Why did they come if not because of her? A scowl grew on Bran's face, but before he could speak, Moiraine suddenly whirled her vine-carved staff above her head, spinning it with both hands. Rand's gasp echoed that of the villagers, for a hissing white flame flared from each end of the staff, standing straight out like spear points despite the rods whirling. Even Bran and Harrell edged away from her. She snapped her arms down straight out before her, the staff parallel to the ground, but the pale fire still jetted out, brighter than the torches. Men shied away, held up hands to shield their eyes from the pain of that brilliance. Is this what Amon's blood has come to? The Aes Sedai's voice was not loud, but it overwhelmed every other sound. Little people squabbling for the right to hide like rabbits? You have forgotten who you were. Forgotten what you were. But I had hoped some small part was left. Some memory in blood and bone. Some shred to steal you for the long night coming. No one spoke. The two Coplins looked as if they had never wanted to open their mouths again. Bran said, Forgotten who we were. We are who we always have been. Honest farmers and shepherds and craftsmen. Two rivers folk. To the south, Moraine said, lies the river you call the White River. But far to the east of here, men call it still by its rightful name, Monetharendrel. In the old tongue, Waters of the mountain home. Sparkling waters that once coursed through a land of bravery and beauty. Two thousand years ago, Manetha and Drell flowed by the walls of a mountain city, so lovely to behold that Ogier stonemasons came to stare in wonder. Farms and villages covered this region, and that you call the Forest of Shadows as well, and beyond. But all of those folk thought of themselves as the people of the mountain home, the people of Mun Etheren. Their king was Aemon Alcar Al Thorin, Aemon, son of Car, son of Thorin, and Eldrain, I Elon, I Carlon, was his queen. Aemon, a man so fearless that the greatest compliment for courage any could give, even among his enemies, was to say a man had Aemon's heart. Eldrain, so beautiful that it was said the flowers bloomed to make her smile. Bravery and beauty and wisdom, and a love that death could not sunder. Weep if you have a heart for the loss of them, for the loss of even their memory. Weep for the loss of their blood. She fell silent then, but no one spoke. Rand was as bound as the others in the spell she had created. When she spoke again, he drank it in, and so did the rest. For nearly two centuries the Trolloc Wars had ravaged the length and breadth of the world, and wherever battles raged, the Red Eagle Banner of Manetherin was in the forefront. The men of Manetherin were a thorn to the Dark One's foot and a bramble to his hand. Sing of Manetherin that would never bend knee to the shadow. Sing of Manetherin, the sword that could not be broken. They were far away, the men of Manetherin, on the field of Bekar, called the Field of Blood when news came that a Trolloc army was moving against their home. Too far to do else but wait to hear of their land's death, for the forces of the Dark One meant to make an end of them. Kill the mighty oak by hacking away its roots. Too far to do else but mourn. But they were the men of the mountain home. Without hesitation, without thought for the distance they must travel, they marched from the very field of victory, still covered in dust and sweat and blood. Day and night they marched, for they had seen the horror a Trolloc army left behind it, and no man of them could sleep while such a danger threatened Manetherin. They moved as if their feet had wings, marching further and faster than friends hoped or enemies feared they could. At any other day that march alone would have inspired songs. When the Dark One's armies swooped down upon the lands of Manetherin, the men of the mountain home stood before it with their backs to the Tarendrel. Some villager raised a small cheer then, but Moraine kept on as if she had not heard. The host that faced the men of Monetherin was enough to daunt the bravest heart. Ravens blackened the sky. Trollocs blackened the land. Trollocs and their human allies. Trollocs and dark friends 
in tens of tens of thousands, and dread lords to command. At night their cookfires outnumbered the stars, and dawn revealed the banner of Baalzaman at their head. Baalzaman, heart of the dark, an ancient name for the father of lies. The Dark One could not have been free of his prison at Sheol for if he had been, not all the forces of humankind together could have stood against him. But there was power there. Dread lords, and some evil that made that light-destroying banner seem no more than right, and sent a chill into the souls of men who faced it. Yet they knew what they must do. Their homeland lay just across the river. They must keep that host and the power with it from the mountain home. Amon had sent out messengers. Aid was promised if they could hold for but three days at the Tarendrel. Hold for three days against odds that should overwhelm them in the first hour. Yet somehow, through bloody assault and desperate defense, they held through an hour, and the second hour, and the third. For three days they fought, and though the land became a butcher's yard, no crossing of the Tarendrel did they yield. By the third night, no help had come, and no messengers, and they fought on alone. For six days, for nine, and on the tenth day, Amon knew the bitter taste of betrayal. No help was coming, and they could hold the river crossings no more. Where did they go? Hari demanded. Torch fires flickered in the chill night breeze, but no one made a move to draw a cloak tighter. Amon crossed the Tarendrel, Moraine told them, destroying the bridges behind him. And he sent word throughout his land for the people to flee, for he knew the powers with the Trolloc horde would find a way to bring it across the river. Even as the word went out, the Trolloc crossing began, and the soldiers of Monetherin took up the fight again, to buy with their lives what hours they could for their people to escape. From the city of Monetherin, Eldraine organized the flight of her people into the deepest forests and the fastness of the mountains. But some did not flee. First in a trickle, then in a river, then a flood, men went not to safety, but to join the army fighting for their land. Shepherds with bows and farmers with pitchforks, and woodsmen with axes. Women went too, shouldering what weapons they could find and marching side by side with their men. No one made that journey who did not know they would never return. But it was their land. It had been their father's, and it would be their children's. And they went to pay the price of it. Not a step of ground was given up until it was soaked in blood. But at the last, the army of Monetherin was driven back. Back to here. To this place you now call Emmons Field. And here the Trolloc hordes surrounded them. Her voice held the sound of cold tears. Trolloc dead and the corpses of human renegades piled up in mounds, but always more scrambled over those charnel heaps and waves of death that had no end. There could be but one finish. No man or woman who had stood beneath the banner of the Red Eagle at that day's dawning still lived when night fell. The sword that could not be broken was shattered. In the mountains of mist, alone in the emptied city of Monetherin, Eldraine felt Amon die, and her heart died with him. And where her heart had been was left only a thirst for vengeance. Vengeance for her love. Vengeance for her people and her land. Driven by grief, she reached out to the true source and hurled the one power at the Trolloc army. And there the dreadlords died wherever they stood, whether in their secret councils or exhorting their soldiers. In the passing of a breath, the dread lords and the generals of the Dark One's host burst into flame. Fire consumed their bodies, and terror consumed their just victorious army. Now they ran like beasts before a wildfire in the forest, with no thought for anything but escape. North and south they fled. Thousands drowned attempting to cross the Tarendrel without the aid of the dread lords. And at the Monethandrel, they tore down the bridges in their fright at what might be following them. Where they found people, they slew and burned. But to flee was the need that gripped them. Until at last, no one of them remained in the lands of Manetherin. They were dispersed like dust before the whirlwind. 
The final vengeance came more slowly, but it came. When they were hunted down by other peoples, by other armies in other lands, none was left alive of those who did murder at Amon's field. But the price was high for Manetherin. Eldraine had drawn to herself more of the one power than any human could ever hope to wield unaided. As the enemy generals died, so did she die. And the fires that consumed her consumed the empty city of Monethrin, even the stones of it, down to the living rock of the mountains. Yet the people had been saved. Nothing was left of their farms, their villages, or their great city. Some would say there was nothing left for them, nothing but to flee to other lands, where they could begin anew. They did not say so. They had paid such a price in blood and hope for their land as had never been paid before, and now they were bound to that soil by ties stronger than steel. Other wars would rack them in years to come, until at last their corner of the world was forgotten, and at last they had forgotten wars and the ways of war. Never again did Monetherin rise. Its soaring spires and splashing fountains became as a dream that slowly faded from the minds of its people. But they and their children, and their children's children, held the land that was theirs. They held it when the long centuries had washed the why of it from their memories. They held it until today. There is you. Weep for Mon Etherin. Weep for what is lost forever. The fires on Moraine's staff winked out, and she lowered it to her side as if it weighed a hundred pounds. For a long moment, the moan of the wind was the only sound. Then Pate Dalkar shouldered past the Coplins. I don't know about your story, the long-jawed farmer said. I'm no thorn to the Dark One's foot, nor ever likely to be, neither. But my will is walking because of you, and for that I am ashamed to be here. I don't know if you can forgive me, but whether you will or no, I'll be going. And for me, you can stay in Emmons Field as long as you like. With a quick duck of his head, almost a bow, he pushed back through the crowd. Others began to mutter then, offering shamefaced penitence before they too slipped away one by one. The Coplins, sour mouthed and scowling once more, looked at the faces around them and vanished into the night without a word. Billy Conger had disappeared even before his cousins. Land pulled Rand back and shut the door. Let's go, boy. The warder started for the back of the inn. Come along, both of you, quickly. Rand hesitated, exchanging a wondering glance with Matt. While Moraine had been telling the story, Master Alvir's Durans could not have dragged him away, but now something else held his feet. This was the real beginning, leaving the inn and following the warder into the night. He shook himself and tried to firm his resolve. He had no choice but to go, but he would come back to Emmons Field, however far or long this journey was. What are you waiting for? Lan asked from the door that led out of the back of the common room. With a start, Matt hurried to him. Trying to convince himself that he was beginning a grand adventure, Rand followed them through the darkened kitchen and out into the stable yard. Thank you.